all for it because as a liberal educator you've got to introduce students to all possible approaches uh, sympathetically critical or antagonistically critical according to your own view provided you've told them where you stand I've never after I read Stratton I've never started a course of lectures without telling the students at the beginning what my religious political philosophies are and what approach I take to economics and then I say I don't expect you to agree with me and I would rather read a first-class attack on me than a third-rate agreement, but I want you to know where I come from. I think you should always start with conceptual foundations before you model. And, uh, but you, uh, I mean, I've always taught theory in a historical context, saying wh who originated it, what, what were the institutions dominant in, in their time, what was their own per, uh, personal background and why did they come at it like this? Uh, and then I would ask, well, okay, this is the, an outline of the structure that they provided. Uh, is it or, or is it not now applicable to what we're, uh, what's happening in the, in the world today? And very often it is because economics uh, doesn't evolve like physics does so that you can disregard what's gone before, often the ideas of the greats of the past are still relevant, sometimes in a modified form, to be put into your structure of thought in the present day. A Keynesian economist means that uh, Keynes in particular put aggregate demand alongside aggregate supply in producing a, a new theory of the determination of level of employment and activity. And he claimed that Thomas Robert Malthus, whom he called the first of the Cambridge economists, had this idea, uh, but was defeated by the, with his debates in, with Ricardo, and so the whole concept of aggregate demand vanished for a hundred years. Uh, and he, he brought it back when he was thinking about how do I explain these prolonged and terrible levels of unemployment, both in the 20s and even more so in the 30s. And he developed his uh, new theory round the interplay of aggregate demand and aggregate supply and resurrected the term that Maltus, amongst others, used, effective demand, where effective demand where was the point where aggregate demand and aggregate supply were equalised in the short period. Um, so if you don't like the phrase short period, use rest state. That there was implied a rest state where what business people thought people were going to spend on investment goods and consumption goods and what business people were willing to supply in the existing conditions and the existing price levels and their expected profits matched up. And when they matched up, in the, uh, there were two meanings to aggregate demand. One was in the mind of the entrepreneurs, the business people, what people were going to spend. In the case of investment, as a shortcut, a, a reasonable assumption you could say, they knew exactly as far as fixed assets were concerned because they would have been placed as orders. What they didn't know exactly was whether they would achieve or not their planned rates of inventory accumulation, which is also a very important part of investment as we know. But they had to anticipate what the consumers would spend out of whatever incomes they had on consumption goods. But then the all-seeing economist, uh, macroeconomist, uh, macro looking at the economy as a whole, would see uh, a function for planned investment expenditure and the aggregate consumption function, which showed in the given conditions at each level of personal disposable income 
what consumers in aggregate would spend on consumption. And when all those three things matched up, you were at the point of effective demand, and that was a rest state unless something happened to change the level of planned investment expenditure or the level of consumption expenditure out of a given level of personal disposable income. It was taken by the mainstream to be a, an aggregation problem. How do you, ag how do you aggregate capital uh, to explain the distribution of income? And of course, some of them said, well, you don't have to. Uh, if you're a general equilibrium theorist. But really, as Joan Robinson stressed more and more, and so did I, it was really which, what vision of the workings of the economies you have in your mind. Do you come out of um, uh, the, the um, Fisherian, well, well, fish is a good example, that the consumer queen is, is the guiding factor trying to maximise her expected utility over her lifetime um, by uh, dividing her income between consumption and saving and all the other agents, uh, not agents, all the other sort of institutions in society, firms, stock exchanges and so on, um, are means of the end of her achieving or not achieving these ends. That's one vision, very much an individual uh, subjective value uh, uh, vision. The other comes out of Marx and Smith and, uh, and then Keynes um, where the swashbuckling ruthless entrepreneur capitalist is the principal decision maker and all the other aspects of society dance to their tune. And according to which of those visions you have, so you have very different views on what you're analysing and what your policies are going to be. Joan Robinson defines post-Keynesian economics as an approach which takes account of the fact that you can't escape uncertainty. So you have to make decisions about the future which you don't know what it's going to be. Lying behind proper Keynesian analysis is the assumption that everybody, or all important decision makers, are doing it in an environment of fundamental uncertainty. So that expectations, both in short-term expectations and long-term expectations have a central role to play. And it's in the light of people's expectations and then the total outcome of what they do, we see whether expectations are realised or not. And if they're not, then in Keynes's analysis there are a variety of different stories of how the decision makers react to the signals that are given out by the initial non-realisation of expectations. So you can tell a story of approaching the short period rest state. Risk can be handled by probability theory and a, a definite number be put on it. Uncertainty can't. As Keynes has a famous description in his 1937 QJE article, ending up, we simply do not know. What is going to be the price of wheat 20 years on? When will the Third World War start? Well, we know the answer to that if, if Trump becomes president. But leaving that aside, we don't know when the Third World War is going to start or if it ever will. Uh, well, I think uh, we're, we're, we're quite a, what do you call it, pluralist lot. Uh, and people, I mean, Joan, for example, was a left Keynesian. Kahn was much more a liberal, I think. Austin Robinson was a pragmatist. Uh, Redaway was, if anything, a liberal. But they all had a very similar approach. I mean, they put, in the case of people like Austin and Brian Redaway, they'd learned Marshall and they'd learned Keynes. And from that, they developed everything else they ever did. Garignani is very influenced by Piero Sraffa, or his, t his take on Piero Sraffa. And he has this view that uh, the only uh, refined formalistic theory you can do is about the long period. And it's very peculiar because uh, his school says you can only theorise about sustained and persistent forces. Yes. But there is no more sustained or persistent force than fundamental uncertainty. And that is ruled out uh, in their long period analysis, as you'll know from 
uh, the work of Kurtz and um, uh, Neri Salvadori in their great book on the long period, and Ian Steedman to a certain extent as well. Well, historically, yes, you cannot exclude Piero Raffa from under the rubric of post-Keynesianism, but I'm mean, here I disagree with Peter Chrysler, he won't have a bar of including Sraffians as opposed to Sraffa. And of course Sraffa was very critical of parts of Keynes's theory because it was based on Marshall and in turn that was based on subjective value rather than uh, uh, the, the objective value theory of the classicals and, and his dear friend David Ricardo. Please be kind to my dear friend David, or don't be harsh on my dear friend David. But of course, uh, um, Sraffa was, uh, was a great admirer, most of all, of Marx, and he thought that Marx, was the, Marx and his approach was the last word in how to understand capitalism, and that his own role was just to fill in some unfinished business or correct some, you know, things that may have gone wrong in a minor sort of way, but the whole uh, structure and thought and multi-dimensional uh, system of Marx, he thought, that's it. I, I belong in that. Well, Passanetti is, is a unique figure because he's a great admirer of the classics and of uh, 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 Ricardo and of Marx and of Keynes, but He's also a very devout Catholic, so uh, that has put him aside from Garignani and Sraffa, who loathe the Church of Rome. In fact, Garignani once told me, do not make jokes about religion, and especially the Church of Rome. It's far too serious to joke about. Uh, and um, uh, when once uh, when Sraffa lost his temper with me, when we were having a discussion about uh, the review article that Vince Massaro and I made of his production of commodities, he said, when I said, but Piero, last time we met you, you agreed with what I just said. He said, screaming at me with his white eyebrows hitting the sky, I am not the Pope, I am not infallible. <laughs> so th there's a gulf there, I think that's why uh, Passanetti, who was much more positive in his contributions than Garignani, was cho not chosen to be Sraffa's executor. But that's conjecture, but that's, that's what I think. Mm -hmm. uh, but, I mean, Passanetti, I've always argued, is the last, probably the last of the great system builders in our uh, miserable subject, as Keynes called it. Though no one less miserable than Keynes would be hard to find. Uh, but Passanetti has this view that you have to distinguish between fundamental relationships which are independent of institutions, which exist prior to, and then you do particular periodic analysis when particular institutions are dominating. And these principles are not over, uh, not, not overset, uh, uh, you know, not, um, they're there underlying it, but they take a particular form according to the historical period you're looking at. And this is, this is consistent with one of the greatest books ever written on the development of the subject, A.K. Das Gupta's Epochs of Economic Theory. As far as post Keynesian economics is concerned, uh, I've developed a structure based on Joan Robinson, Kaletsky, Keynes, Marx, um, uh, S Smith and Ricardo and uh, you know Kahn and and uh, uh, to put together a, a try trying to understand the processes at work in a modern uh, capitalist economy characterized by on the whole oligopolistic market structures and the Keynesian Kaletskian forces at work and I've come increasingly to be influenced by the work of uh, Richard Goodwin, uh, uh, which culminated in his growth cycle model and putting together production interdependent models and aggregate cycle models, and late Kaletsky, where he said the long run trend is not an independent entity, it grows out of 
a succession of short period happenings. And th so that, I think that's the best way uh, that I know to understand what is going on in modern capitalism. Uh, and of course you have to then put in Marx's insight and followed up by uh, it's a Keynesian insight as well that finance capital and industrial capital and commercial capital are all inter interwoven and when finance capital is out of kilter with um, <clears throat> industrial capital and commercial capital then you'll get instability and often crisis and I think that vision as it were makes far more sense of what's happened in the last 30 or 40 years in the modern world, particularly when it's allied with the rise of multinational oligopolistic uh, industries uh, who dominate national governments and international trade and borrowing and lending. <laughs>